The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentleman, by Washington Irving. Preface to the Revised Edition. Quote, I have no wife nor children, good or bad, to provide for. A mere spectator of other men's fortunes and adventures, and how they play their parts, which methinks are diversely presented unto me as from a common theatre or scene. End quote. Burton. The following papers, with two exceptions, were written in England and formed but part of an intended series for which I had made notes and memorandums. Before I could mature a plan, however, circumstances compelled me to send them piecemeal to the United States, where they were published from time to time in portions or numbers. It was not my intention to publish them in England, being conscious that much of their contents could be interesting only to American readers, and in truth being deterred by the severity with which American productions had been treated by the British press. By the time the contents of the first volume had appeared in this occasional manner, they began to find their way across the Atlantic, and to be inserted, with many kind encomiums, in the London Literary Gazette. It was said also that a London bookseller intended to publish them in a collective form. I determined, therefore, to bring them forward myself, that they might at least have the benefit of my superintendence and revision. I accordingly took the printed numbers which I had received from the United States to Mr. John Murray, the eminent publisher from whom I had already received friendly attentions, and left them with him for examination, informing him that should he be inclined to bring them before the public, I had materials enough on hand for a second volume. Several days having elapsed without any communication from Mr. Murray, I addressed a note to him, in which I construed his silence into a tacit rejection of my work, and begged that the numbers I had left with him might be returned to me. The following was his reply. My dear sir, I entreat you to believe that I feel truly obliged by your kind intentions towards me, and that I entertain the most unfeigned respect for your most tasteful talents. My house is completely filled with workpeople at this time, and I have only an office to transact business in and yesterday I was wholly occupied, or I should have done myself the pleasure of seeing you. If it would not suit me to engage in the publication of your present work, it is only because I do not see that scope in the nature of it which would enable me to make those satisfactory accounts between us, without which I really feel no satisfaction in engaging but I will do all I can to promote their circulation, and shall be most ready to attend to any future plan of yours. With much regard, I remain, dear sir, your faithful servant, John Murray. This was disheartening, and might have deterred me from any further prosecution of the matter, had the question of republication in Great Britain rested entirely with me but I apprehended the appearance of a spurious edition. I now thought of Mr. Archibald Constable as publisher. Having been treated by him with much hospitality during a visit to Edinburgh. But first I determined to submit my work to Sir Walter, then Mr. Scott, being encouraged to do so by the cordial reception I had experienced from him at Abbotsford a few years previously and to buy the favourable opinion he had expressed to others of my earlier writings. I accordingly sent him the printed numbers of the sketch-book in a parcel by coach, and at the same time wrote to him, hinting that since I had had the pleasure of partaking of his hospitality, a reverse had taken place in my affairs which made the successful exercise of my pen 
all important to me. I begged him, therefore, to look over the literary articles I had forwarded to him, and, if he thought they would bear European republication, to ascertain whether Mr. Constable would be inclined to be the publisher. The parcel containing my work went by coach to Scott's address in Edinburgh. The letter went by mail to his residence in the country. By the very first post I received a reply, before he had seen my work. I was down at Kelso, said he, when your letter reached Abbotsford. I am now on my way to town, and will converse with Constable, and do all in my power to forward your views. I assure you nothing will give me more pleasure. The hint, however, about a reverse of fortune had struck the quick apprehension of Scott, and, with that practical and efficient good will which belonged to his nature, he had already devised a way of aiding me. A weekly periodical, he went on to inform me, was about to be set up in Edinburgh. Supported by the most respectable talents, and amply furnished with all the necessary information. The appointment of the editor, for which ample funds were provided, would be five hundred pounds sterling a year, with the reasonable prospect of further advantages. This situation, being apparently at his disposal, he frankly offered to me. The work, however, he intimated, was to have somewhat of a political bearing, and he expressed an apprehension that the tone it was desired to adopt might not suit me. Yet I risked the question, added he, because I know no man so well qualified for this important task, and perhaps because it will necessarily bring you to Edinburgh. If my proposal does not suit, you need only keep the matter secret, and there is no harm done and for my love I pray you wrong me not. If on the contrary you think it could be made to suit you, let me know as soon as possible, addressing Castle Street, Edinburgh. In a postscript written from Edinburgh, he adds, I am just come here, and have glanced over the sketch-book. It is positively beautiful, and increases my desire to crimp you, if it be possible. Some difficulties there always are in managing such a matter, especially at the outset, but we will obviate them as much as we possibly can. The following is from an imperfect draft of my reply, which underwent some modifications in the copy sent. I cannot express how much I am gratified by your letter. I had begun to feel as if I had taken an unwarrantable liberty. But somehow or other there is a genial sunshine about you that warms every creeping thing into heart and confidence. Your literary proposal both surprises and flatters me, as it evinces a much higher opinion of my talents than I have myself. I then went on to explain that I found myself peculiarly unfitted for the situation offered to me not merely by my political opinions, but by the very constitution and habits of my mind. My whole course of life, I observed, has been desultory, and I am unfitted for any periodically recurring task, or any stipulated labor of body or mind. I have no command of my talents, such as they are, and have to watch the varyings of my mind as I would those of a weathercock. Practice and training may bring more into rule, but at present I am as useless for regular service as one of my own country Indians or a Don Cossack. I must, therefore, keep on pretty much as I have begun, writing when I can, not when I would, I shall occasionally shift my residence, and write whatever is suggested by objects before me, or whatever rises in my imagination, and hope to write better and more copiously by and by. I am playing the egotist, but I know no better way of answering your proposal 
than by showing what a very good-for-nothing kind of being I am. Should Mr. Constable feel inclined to make a bargain for the wares I have on hand, he will encourage me to further enterprise, and it will be something like trading with a gypsy for the fruits of his prowlings, who may at one time have nothing but a wooden bowl to offer, and at another time a silver tankard. In reply, Scott expressed regret, but not surprise, at my declining what might have proved a troublesome duty. He then recurred to the original subject of our correspondence, entered into a detail of the various terms upon which arrangements were made between authors and booksellers, that I might take my choice, expressing the most encouraging confidence of the success of my work, and of previous works which I had produced in America. I did no more, added he, than open the trenches with Constable, but I am sure, if you will take the trouble to write to him, you will find him disposed to treat your overtures with every degree of attention or if you think it of consequence in the first place to see me, I shall be in London in the course of a month. And whatever my experience can command is most heartily at your command. But I can add little to what I have said above, except my earnest recommendation to Constable to enter into the negotiation. Note I cannot avoid subjoining in a note a succeeding paragraph of Scott's letter, which, though it does not relate to the main subject of our correspondence, was too characteristic to be omitted. Some time previously I had sent Miss Sophia Scott small duodecimo American editions of her father's poems published in Edinburgh in quarto volumes, showing the nigromancy of the American press, by which a quart of wine is conjured into a pint bottle. Scott observes, In my hurry I have not thanked you in Sophia's name for the kind attention which furnished her with the American volumes. I am not quite sure I can add my own, since you have made her acquainted with much more of Papa's folly than she would ever otherwise have learned, for I have taken special care they should never see any of those things during their earlier years. I think I have told you that Walter is sweeping the firmament with a feather like a maypole, and indenting the pavement with a sword like a scythe. In other words, he has become a whiskered hussar in the 18th Dragoons. End of note. Before the receipt of this most obliging letter, however, I had determined to look to no leading bookseller for a launch, but to throw my work before the public at my own risk, and let it sink or swim according to its merits. I wrote to that effect to Scott, and soon received a reply. I observe with pleasure that you are going to come forth in Britain. It is certainly not the very best way to publish on one's own account for the booksellers set their face against the circulation of such works as do not pay an amazing toll to themselves. But they have lost the art of altogether damming up the road, in such cases between the author and the public, which they were once able to do as effectually as Diabolus in John Bunyan's Holy War closed up the windows of my Lord Understanding's mansion. I am sure of one thing, that you have only to be known to the British public to be admired by them. And I would not say so, unless I really was of that opinion. If you ever see a witty but rather local publication called Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, you will find some notice of your works in the last number. The author is a friend of mine, to whom I have introduced you in your literary capacity. His name is Lockhart a young man of very considerable talent, and who will soon be intimately connected with my family. My faithful friend Knickerbocker is to be next examined and illustrated. Constable was extremely willing to enter into consideration of a treaty for your works, but I foresee will still be more so when your name is up and may go from Toledo to Madrid. 
and that will soon be the case. I trust to be in London about the middle of the month, and promise myself great pleasure in once again shaking you by the hand. The first volume of the sketchbook was put to press in London, as I had resolved, at my own risk, by a bookseller unknown to fame, and without any of the usual arts by which a work is trumpeted into notice. Still, some attention had been called to it by the extracts which had previously appeared in the Literary Gazette, and by the kind words spoken by the editor of that periodical. And it was getting into fair circulation when my worthy bookseller failed before the first month was over, and the sale was interrupted. At this juncture Scott arrived in London. I called to him for help as I was sticking in the mire, and, more propitious than Hercules, he put his own shoulder to the wheel. Through his favorable representations, Murray was quickly induced to undertake the future publication of the work which he had previously declined. A further edition of the first volume was struck off, and the second volume was put to press, and from that time Murray became my publisher, conducting himself in all his dealings with that fair, open, and liberal spirit which had obtained for him the well-merited appellation of the Prince of Booksellers. Thus, under the kind and cordial auspices of Sir Walter Scott, I began my literary career in Europe, and I feel that I am but discharging, in a trifling degree, my debt of gratitude to the memory of that golden-hearted man, in acknowledging my obligations to him. But who of his literary contemporaries ever applied to him for aid or counsel that did not experience the most prompt, generous, and effectual assistance? Washington Irving, Sunnyside, 1848